routine video, and this time we're going over the TJ bot, and plus with John Cohn. So John, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm John. Um, I've been in IBM 35 years. I'm the chief scientist for the Watson IoT division, and I'm based in Munich and helping bring up our new headquarters there, and we're going to get him here. All right, so let's begin. Uh, now, today we're talking about IoT. So you specialize in IoT, uh, and lots in IoT, cognitive IoT. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, but today we're really specially going to be talking about the TJ bot. Uh, and the reason I'm actually so interested in this is because it's a perfect example uh, for really kids and beginners to get into uh, IoT and really cognitive IoT with Watson. Uh, Where'd you get that, that? Where did you get that TJ yeah, bot? Yes, so that's what I was just oh. about to get to. Uh, so. Actually, this TJ bot over here, I actually got this TJ bot from Rob High with, from my innovation talk yesterday uh, at IBM Interconnect 2017. That's actually where we are right now uh, in a meeting room. Uh, so we're at Interconnect 2017. Yesterday, I had an innovation talk with Rob High, uh, and on stage, he actually uh, surprised me with this gift. Uh, so this is absolutely great. Thanks, Rob, uh, for giving us the TJ bot. And now I can't wait to really create some really neat IMS, uh, or IoT stuff with this. Uh, so I guess we can just you know, open this up and talk a little bit about what the TJ bot actually is and what it is. Uh, Why don't we talk a little bit about IoT? So I'm yeah. kind of curious what you think. I think of you as a cognitive guy. Tell me about your interest in IoT. Definitely. Well, the Internet of Things, you know this, but the Internet of Things is about connecting everything. And that's really what I love about IoT, how we can gather so much big data. And since I absolutely love cognitive, that's amazing for me. Because the thing is, big data and cognitive really fit together. Uh, because of course, the more data you have, the better your cognitive ability. Uh, what do you think about IoT? Well, I don't, you know, two years ago, I didn't even know how to spell IoT, but it turns out that I've been making things that are hooked to uh, each other, hooked to the internet for a long time, and I really like that. And what we're finding is it's it's coming up in just so many industries, in cars, medicine, insurance, and it's really, really fun to actually, exactly. you know, it's, it's, it combines the physical world and the logical world. And what I, I think you're exactly right is, especially when you make that cognitive, when you can make a thing smart, when you can make a thing learn. Exactly. And actually the ideas we were talking about downstairs really got me thinking about something. I, I've got an idea. All right. In fact, if you'd like to t know more about what we were talking about, I have a YouTube video about that as well, and there will be a link to that in the description so you can find out more about that. But all right, now let's get to the TJ bot and what it's capable of with IoT. So John, what do you really love about the TJ bot? And also, while we're doing that, uh, I'm actually just going to start you know, opening up the TJ bot, and there's going to be a separate video of how you can actually set up the TJ bot, uh, construct it, uh, for, and you can actually get these from Amazon, by the way, uh, link in the description, uh, and of course, uh, what exactly these are, what these do, and some example code to get you running with the TJ bot. So, John, though, what do you love about the TJ bot? Well, what the TJ bot is a little cardboard friend that has a uh, a small computer, Raspberry Pi, which I'm sure most of your viewers know about, and a, a couple of other features for input and output. It has a small servo motor for moving. It has a camera for seeing. It has a microphone for hearing, and then you can use all of the Watson APIs to, to bring life to it. And it's, we put these things out so that you can make them yourselves. You can either buy one on Amazon, or we'll send you the files so you can cut them out on your own laser cutter. And what we're finding is there's no limit to the, the kind of uh, creativity that people have and what they've applied. I hooked mine up to a Tesla coil so that when I talk to it, it sent out a quarter of a million volt spark. <laughs> I really can't wait to see what you make. Exactly. Thank you. So, of course, though, we will collaborate on that. We'll create another YouTube video about an example with the TJ bot as well. All right. So, the TJ bot is actually powered by a Raspberry Pi, of course, a uh, single board computer. Uh, and so, the Raspberry Pi is basically the heart of the TJ bot. It's the mind of the TJ bot, and it's what controls uh, everything that the TJ bot has. Uh, now, the TJ bot also comes with, of course, speakers, microphones, and cameras. Uh, the, in this case, we're using the Anchor uh, Bluetooth speaker for its audio. Uh, and apart from that, of course, we've got some other accessories in this box. Uh, but I guess you could say the main part in this box is the TJ bot itself. And the TJ bot is actually really interesting. And if you could see inside of this cardboard right here. Let's take one see, of those out. Let's yeah, take sure. Because we can show these. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so if I actually just take out the entire piece here. As you can see, this is actually a piece of cardboard, a little... Um, it unfolds, yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is actually a little um, 
I guess you could say, a piece of cardboard here that's been cut to actually have these little modules that you can actually then rip out, fold, and then you can, you know, attach them together to create your TJ bot. And that's really what's so interesting about these, how it's so easy to set up, uh, and so, uh, so I guess you could say, beginner friendly, kid friendly. Uh, to well, what I what I really like is that this is just a digital file. It's basically a, a, a simple SketchUp file or the equivalent, and you can take take this file, we'll send it to you, you can go into a tool like Illustrator or, or uh, an open source tool and change it. You can resize it, you can add different features and legs, etc. And then you can go to a makerspace like we have in Munich or most big exactly. cities have them, and you can actually cut it out with your own laser. This is so much fun, it's about 90 seconds to cut out both sides of it. And it even smells good when you're doing it. <laughs> and that's the best part. All right, so that's the TJ bot, uh, what's in the box and how it's powered. But John Cohn, would you like to go over a little bit about what developers can actually do with the TJ bot and what it's capable of? Well, basically, you know, what you're doing is you're making a really cute embodiment of a Raspberry Pi mm. that has a camera, a microphone, and a, and a, a motor actuator. Exactly. And so, you know, that is, if you think about it, it's like a canvas. You can paint anything mm -hmm. on that. So we've had people, uh, we've had people do face recognition like you and I were talking about. Exactly. We've had people do uh, music, you know, play music. Actually, believe it or not, this uh, wireless speaker has really got a nice uh, sound system. So you can use it like, you know, play my favorite song. Um, we have, <clears throat> I used mine, as I said, to, to, I build Tesla coils, which generate uh, like a quarter million to half a million volts, you know, a meter long spark. And I hooked my uh, TJ bot up to, so I could tell it to turn the Tesla coil on. Exactly. One thing I noticed is you never should put a Raspberry Pi too close to a quarter of a million volts. <laughs> so on my second Raspberry Pi, I put them further apart. But uh, people have done all sorts of things with them. And then not only can you decorate the inside of this with code, you can decorate the outside. Exactly. I, uh, I'll tell you a story. Is uh, We just had a hackathon in uh, Munich, in where I work, and uh, we made a bunch of them. We made, uh, made 11 of them for people. And in testing one of those, one of my, uh, uh, one of my uh, uh, colleagues put, played a prank on me. She's not even a software person. She's very smart. She's not a software person. And she made a, a TJ bot. We have a bunch of them around. And she made one around, around that, that whenever I walked by, it said, Hey, John. <laughs> I think she was pushing a button, but it really surprised me because it had never talked to me before. It had exactly. always been there. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's what you can do with the TJ bot. That's what it's capable of and why it's so interesting. Uh, and so that's what we had to cover about the TJ bot and IoT. Uh, now I know this is actually quite a short video, but unfortunately we don't have enough, uh, I guess you could say, time to actually go through creating an example application just yet. But very soon you'll be seeing another collaboration video uh, with me and John Cohen, my mentor, uh, with uh, of course this IoT project and of course setting up the TJ bot itself, uh, working with its software and creating some really interesting and neat applications that use the power of Watson and of course IoT in order to create a really powerful mix with the TJ bot. I can't wait oh. to see what you're going to build. It's going to be interesting, I'm sure. Definitely. Thank you. All right. So, again, I'd like to say thank you to my mentor, uh, John Cohen. So, of course, uh, please watch out for our next videos. This is going to be in a special playlist uh, for our next video in Toronto, actually, uh, with my other mentor, Marcus Van Kempen in Toronto, uh, and, of course, John Cohen. All right. So, thank you very much for watching today. That's going to be it for the video. And, of course, if you enjoyed, please do make sure to leave a like down below. And if you believe, if you, if you have any other questions, suggestions, or feedback, leave them down in the comment section below. You can email them to me at tajumani.gmail.com or you can tweet them to me at tajumani. John Cohn, how can they contact you? Oh, you know what? I'm John Cohn VT on just about everything. Gmail, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, uh, blog, but John Cohn VT. And I'm the guy that looks kind of like this. I look kind of crazy. So you shouldn't have All any right. trouble finding me. So thank you very much. I can't wait to see what you're going to Perfect. Write. Thank you. But just before we go, if you'd like to subscribe to the channel, if you want to watch more content, please do make sure because it really does help out a lot. And if you'd like to be notified whenever I do release new content, make sure to turn on notifications as well. All right. Thank you very much for watching today. Thank Goodbye. you. Goodbye. So hello there and welcome to another tutorial. My name is Tammy Bakshi and this time we're going to be going over, well, my third IoT video and this time we're going over the TJ bot and plus with John Cohn. So John, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm John. Um, I've been in IBM 35 years. I'm the chief scientist for 
the Watson IoT division and I'm based in Munich and helping bring up our new headquarters there and we're going to get him here. All right, so let's begin. Uh, now, today we're talking about IoT. So you specialize in IoT, uh, and Watson IoT, Cognitive IoT. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, but today we're really specially going to be talking about the TJ Bot. Uh, and the reason I'm actually so interested in this is because it's a perfect example uh, for really kids and beginners to get into uh, IoT and really Cognitive IoT with Watson. Uh, Where did you get that? that? Where did you get that TJ Bot? Yes, yeah, so that's what I was just oh. about to get to. Uh, so. Actually, this TJ Bot over here, I actually got this TJ Bot from Rob High with, from my innovation talk yesterday uh, at IBM Interconnect 2017. That's actually where we are right now uh, in a meeting room. Uh, so we're at Interconnect 2017. Yesterday, I had an innovation talk with Rob High, uh, and on stage, he actually uh, surprised me with this gift. Uh, so this is absolutely great. Thanks, Rob, uh, for giving us the TJ Bot. And now, I can't wait to really create some really neat IMS, uh, or IoT stuff with this. Uh, so I guess we can just you know, open this up and talk a little bit about what the TJ Bot actually is and what it is. Uh, Why don't we talk a little bit about IoT? So I'm yeah. kind of curious what you think. I think of you as a cognitive guy. Tell me about your interest in IoT. Definitely. Well, the Internet of Things, you know this, but the Internet of Things is about connecting everything. And that's really what I love about IoT, how we can gather so much big data. And since I absolutely love cognitive, that's amazing for me. Because the thing is, big data and cognitive really fit together. Uh, because of course, the more data you have, the better your cognitive ability. Uh, what do you think about IoT? Well, I don't, you know, two years ago, I didn't even know how to spell IoT, but it turns out that I've been making things that are hooked to uh, each other, hooked to the internet for a long time, and I really like that. And what we're finding is it's it's coming up in just so many industries, in cars, medicine, insurance, and it's really, really fun to actually, exactly. you know, it's, it's, it combines the physical world and the logical world. And what I, I think you're exactly right is, especially when you make that cognitive, when you can make a thing smart, when you can make a thing learn. Exactly. And actually the ideas we were talking about downstairs really got me thinking about something. I, I've got an idea. All right. In fact, if you'd like to t know more about what we were talking about, I have a YouTube video about that as well, and there will be a link to that in the description so you can find out more about that. But all right, now let's get to the TJ Bot and what it's capable of with IoT. So John, what do you really want about the TJ Bot? And also, while we're doing that, uh, I'm actually just going to start you know, opening up the TJ Bot, and there's going to be a separate video of how you can actually set up the TJ Bot, uh, construct it, uh, for, and you can actually get these from Amazon, by the way, uh, link in the description uh, and of course uh, what exactly these are, what these do and some example code to get you running with a TJ bot so John though All right, hello and welcome everybody to the seventh episode of Tech Life Skills with Tanmay. I hope everyone's doing well. Thank you very much for joining today's live stream. And one of the most popular science fiction characters out there is the mad scientist. Someone so immersed in their passion for doing something at the very bleeding edge of innovation. And today, I'm very excited because we are going to get to do a lot more than just uh, seeing a stock character. Rather, we're going to get to interact with a real-life 
mad scientist. That's right, our special guest for today is my mentor, John Cohn, an IBM fellow at the MIT IBM Watson AI Research Lab, and he's an inventor with over a hundred patents with just under 40 years of experience working in the technology industry. Now, today's episode is going to be absolutely amazing. John is an inspiration to kids, the youth, and adults uh, alike across the globe, and I'm really sure that today's discussion is going to prove to you exactly why that's the case. And I'm actually especially excited because John and I first met back in 2016 at IBM Interconnect. And one of our most memorable moments we've spent is actually when we recorded a video on the TJ bot uh, a year later after that. And so now, without any further ado, let's welcome John Cohn. Hello, John. Welcome to the show. Thank you for coming on. I'm really glad to have you here. And before we begin, would you like to introduce yourself? Tammy, you did such a great job. It's so wonderful to be here. And um, let's see, I think the only thing you'd left out is that I am a total nerd. <laughs> you know, I was born a nerd when I was eight years old. Yeah. I, I knew I wanted to be an engineer and I wanted to go to MIT. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 so great to meet you, you know, you were 12, I think when we met and yes. to find such a kindred spirit. Um, so I, I'm just super happy to be here. Um, I think you nailed all the biographical things and just, you know, getting into the, let's just nerd out. Sounds good. Thank you very much, John. Uh, and I mean, I, I want to start off with something really fun. And this is something that I, that I want to really highlight. And that is, you have an entire TEDx talk on the importance of play. Literally, the title is The Importance of Play. And I feel like, personally, uh, and tell me what you think about this, that play is kind of misunderstood. And I feel like it's misunderstood in a similar way to creativity. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is a little while ago, I was in Winnipeg and I had a, a talk for the Creative Foundation. Um, and, and during that talk, I mentioned how, you know, when we think of creativity, like when you say creativity, some of the first things that would come to your mind would be art, like, like music or, or paintings or things like this. But creativity is a lot more than just that, right? Creativity is, is even engineering. It's writing code. It's solving problems. It's coming up with these novel problems to, novel solutions to problems that we've been facing for, for hundreds of years. And I feel like play is kind of misunderstood in a similar way, which is why the, the title, The Importance of Play, you know, makes such an impact. So could you maybe help us deconstruct what the importance of play actually means? Yeah, I think you really are right. That I mean, and, and I think people intrinsically get that it's it's better to be playful than not to be playful. But yeah. we, we equate it with like bringing, you know, plush toys to work and, and having... <laughs> you know, Nerf gun fights. And while that's great and, you know, work-life balance, you know, like going out and fishing and stuff, work-life balance is supposed to be great. I've never really tried it. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, I think um, it's really about bringing this playful spirit that, you know, when we talk about, you know, embracing, I'm super proud to be a nerd, you know, it's, that's what got us into these fields. And it's not just a technical thing. I think everybody has its their own brand of nerds. Yeah. I think you really said something very powerful, which is that, you know that the the sense of uh, creativity. Sometimes we we talk about science, we talk about engineering, we talk about math. In a way, you know, it, I, I know that when I was raised, it was like get the answer in the back of the book. You know, that it's, it was all about concrete. Um, but but you're exactly right. Nobody gets no engineer gets paid to uh, you know to to solve a problem that's already been solved. No mathematician mm -hmm. goes into the business because she or he wants to get the right answer. It's yeah. all about creativity. I mean, there are very, as a matter of fact, you know, I, I often talk about, you know, when I'm, when I'm trying to encourage people to play, it's a bit like an, an artist or a musician, you know, it's, it's sharing the sheer joy of it. You know, sometimes people say, well, are you doing that just because you want people to go into engineering? And I'm like, no, why would I, you know, there are easier ways to ruin your life. No, I mean, I love engineering, but every, it's not for everybody. No field is for everybody. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, engineering to me is just a scientist with a job, you know, that's pretty cool. But yeah, there are very, there are relatively few fields where you actually get to, you know, paid to only be creative. I mean, there's jobs, I guess, if you're an accountant, and you're creative, you go to jail, right? You know, I, I don't know. Uh, but, but I think the idea of, of sort of telling people what they already know that it's about fiddling around, you know, hacking around, I'm in my shop, I'm sorry, I didn't clean it up for you I really didn't. It's a mess. 
but you know i think we intrinsically all start as kids exploring you know we take yeah. things apart we occasionally hopefully learn to put them back together again though that <laughs> power usually comes quite a bit later and and it and uh somehow over life you know if you're not careful and I, i'm saying that because i know this has happened to me is that you know grown upness kind of starts to chase it out of you you start getting responsibilities you know you got to make you know payments you get a family um you know you get deadlines and and everything kind of piles up and uh, if you're not careful it sort of chases that play playful aspect that we have as kids uh, mm -hmm. out of us and we really got to I think my message is mostly about reminding people what it felt like to yeah. you know to explore to you know if you watch a kid play they're they're exploring they're trying new things they're stealing ideas people are stealing ideas from them they're not really worried about you know the end game they're they're kind of in the moment in flow and and that's the thing that life chases out of us if we don't recommit to it all the time yeah. and so part of my message is just telling myself you know walk away from my screen come in here pick up a soldering iron hopefully the, the cool end and <laughs> That is incredible. And one thing that you mentioned in, in specific there, something that I want to highlight, is that no field is for everybody, right? It, the, reason that we're, the, the reason that you're preaching this importance of play is not so that we get more people into engineering. That's that, you know, a lot of people would think, yeah, that we're trying to make this fun so that we get more people into engineering, but that's not the case. What we're trying to do is just generally bring that, that playful spirit back to everything that we do, right? Regardless of what it is, right? It could be engineering very well could be linguistics, whatever it is, bringing that law. play, that fun. Actually, and, and it's interesting because I have spent a lot of time because I, I, I am constantly asking myself, well, what am I trying to say? And I, I talk to people and there are law nerds and there are, you know, finance nerds yeah. and there are, you know, history nerds. I'm a history minor, by the way, uh, oh, yeah. you know, and big future in it. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, so the idea of, of everybody has that sort of playful element that kind of was the curiosity that got them in. Yeah. And you just have to kind of culture that and, and, and keep it from getting extinguished, but more than that, grow it. And what I found, we'll talk about that is, you know, the the, the beauty of sharing it is it reinforces it. It's, it's great because it reinforces it in yourself. And then it kind of becomes this viral thing. If you, you know, kind of hang out making things with other people and they start, you know, talk, and then you start talking about making things with other people, then other people start making things with other people and all of a sudden <laughs> it explodes. Oh, well. <laughs> Yeah, and I feel like also what you mentioned around the, the, the work-life balance, especially, um, and, and, you know, the, the, the joke you made around, you know, work-life balance, it's supposed to be great, but I've never tried it. I also feel like, um, you know, if, if, if what you do is fun, right, if it's something where you are playing, right, I mean, as you mentioned, you're just an all-around nerd, if you're a law nerd, history, whatever, it doesn't matter. As long as you're having fun, you're passionate about something, when you're working, it's like play. I feel like that is, is the ultimate work-life balance in a way. Right. I mean, for the past couple of days, for example, this is something that I want to get your thoughts on later as well. There's been this application that I'm working on and and and, you know, that it's just the 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 it's not even just because I have to be working on this, this code for, for example, a, a book that I'm writing or for a project that I'm working on, but rather just the fact that I enjoy writing that code so much that I want to do it regardless. Right. It's just something that I want to do because it's so fun. That That's the kind of play element that we want to bring in. It, it's exactly that. And, you know, I. Uh, like uh, without going into the details, you know, my everyone's job has elements of stuff that you have to do that isn't necessarily what you love or what you're good at. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, I got it was last week by Wednesday. I was realizing that I was spending, you know, hundred percent, spending one hundred and fifty percent of my time doing administrative stuff, which, frankly, yeah. I'm not. I don't like, but I'm not that good at. And so I I decided to misbehave. And I think this is a key element of play is mm -hmm. that. You know, doing something that you're not supposed to be doing. If you know, I, I often tell people that it, you know, if you only do what you're supposed to do, you'll never get. You know, it, it, it's you know, anti-play. Yeah. And it also, I think, most of the the really big breakthroughs that uh, you know, at least in my life, you know, the, the the innovations that I've done, or when I look around, and again, not just in engineering, that usually comes from somebody doing something that they weren't technically supposed to do. So I spent yeah. the rest of the week, the, the end part of the week, coding when I should have been listening in meetings and people, you know, the nice thing about Zoom is no one, you know, it's like no one can see if you're wearing pants, well, no one can see if you're soldering. <laughs> <laughs> writing code. 
Incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, um, yeah, I guess that's the new joke. You know, it's it's not that you're not wearing pants on Zoom. You're you're, you're soldering on Zoom or coding on Zoom. <laughs> yeah. And I've been, uh, I, I was telling about the project, which I can't talk about here, but, uh, you know, I've been writing really bad microcode all week. And, and when yeah. I'm supposed to be doing something else, it feels great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I feel like that's another big part of it is is even like, like as you're, for example, this is just one example, but this applies to every field, like in, in the field of technology for example right as, as you're learning to code don't be afraid to write bad code don't be afraid to make those mistakes it's, it's about making them and learning from them um, that's going to enable you to learn through play in, in, in my opinion and I yeah go ahead well I was just gonna say an element of that just to pick up on a thread I think yeah applying play to writing bad code is that we get very afraid of, of making mistakes and mm -hmm. actually you know mistakes you know are, are kind of you know, considered something you avoid. And of course, nobody wants to make mistakes, but, mm -hmm. but, you know, in a playful spirit, you write, you, you know, the most interesting thing is like, oh, that didn't work that way. You know, isn't that interesting? You know, yeah. so writing bad code is really finding all of the ways that it's not supposed to work and then exhaustive by exhaustive uh, exploration, you figure out what it's supposed to do. Yeah, exactly. I love, I love the exhaustive exploration that you mentioned because actually specifically the, the project that we were working on, um, one, one example of that exhaustive exploration that I feel like is, is really important is um, we're working on this little application that can sort of brute force a, a certain um, a, a hash, uh, a SHA-256 hash that meets a certain condition for an input string. Um, and we've gone through, uh, me and my, my friend Omer that are working on this, we've gone through all sorts of different solutions to try and figure out how to do this. One of the solutions that we started off with was just, you know, single-threaded, generate a random string, go ahead and, and check it. We then multi-threaded it. And, and, you know, it was this, this sort of exhausted exploration that would enable us to find new techniques that work. So, for example, maybe we have half of our CPUs dedicated to just ra generating random uh, strings and half of our CPUs dedicated to hatching them. What if we were to transition to GPU? Then we wrote CUDA code, and then we were, you know, figuring out, hey, does it make more sense to block on a single GPU and and hash on all the other three? Does it make more sense to generate and hash at the same time? Does it make sense to do all generating and then all hashing? It, it's sort of going through all these different things. And and again, when you're playing, when you're just playing around with the technology, you're writing code for fun. This sort of exhaustive exploration is just your curiosity. Your curiosity yeah. guides you to do all this. And it turns off your inner judge that says, no, I tried that, or that'll exactly. work. You know, you kind of go, what the heck, you know, I'll exactly. spend the next half an hour. It might be wasted, but, but that's how you learn stuff. Exactly. 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 And that's, 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 the, that's the way I love to learn, you know, through that example, through that play. And I feel like the education system is, is, is really something that needs to evolve to, <laughs> to, 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 to adapt this new sort of way of learning through play. Um, and I feel like, you know, today, the way that we look at the education system is also a bit off, right? It's not just the way the system is structured, but it's also the way that we look at the system. And what I mean by that is, you know, there are all these like, um, you know, videos out there of, of, of students and even, you know, billionaires and, and all these sorts of people, very diverse range of people <laughs> talking about things like, you know, when am I ever gonna use algebra or calculus in my life, right? Why am I learning about this? Why am I gonna need to remember the details Details of a certain historical event. Why do I need to remember, you know, World War II battles or whatever? It doesn't matter what it is. And I feel like what we are misunderstanding is that when we're learning concepts like this in school, there are two reasons that I feel like that's important. And first of all, it's because that teaches us a more fundamental problem-solving skill around these are problems that humans have faced in the past. This is how we came to solutions for them, right? Doesn't doesn't matter exactly what those fields are. And we don't realize that we're learning that problem solving capability, but what's amazing about the human mind is that it's just so flexible, right? You are at a fundamental level, you are changing the way your brain is structured. You are be, you're getting better at solving problems, even if you don't realize just by seeing how problems have been solved in the past. Uh, and on top of that as well, I also feel like it's the responsibility in a way of the education system to introduce everybody to certain fields and, and certain topics to enable them to figure out what they're passionate about right where when they work in a field where where do they feel like they're playing so what are your thoughts on the education system today and how do you think it needs to evolve in the future well i think you really that last thing that you said is just fundamental um it, it was very interesting so i th I, th I think it it really comes down to this point of finding out what you're good at and and diving deeper, you know, and mm -hmm. unpacking that. And so I think variety 
is a huge thing, you know, and as a matter of fact, I often see, uh, you know, kids or parents of kids, you know, trying to focus their kid in one thing, you know, medicine, science, math, law, whatever, early on, and that kind of narrows your future, you know, and I think the idea of sort of, it's, we're, we're pretty interesting filters, you know, there's a lot of white noise out there, you have to, you have to actually have a pretty wide spectrum to be able to find those things that you're good at. And actually, there's huge value in finding the things that you aren't good at, or that you frankly hate, you know, I mean, Mm -hmm. there's an interesting kind of uh, a dichotomy that that I ran into as a parent of three uh, very, you know, really bright kids, uh, very different learners. And we'll talk about my kids in a little bit. You, I got endless pictures. No, um, but actually, it was it was interesting because when my older kids were getting to be kind of elementary, middle school, it, what it was during the height of the time where there was a lot of focus on standards. And there's this big debate, you know. Uh, the accountability, things like no child left behind. I mean, Mm -hmm. if you take it at face value, what's not to like about that? You know, there were schools that were not performing and, and teacher, you know, uh, there was sort of a feeling that, you know, people were just kind of going through the motion and some schools weren't, weren't actually giving the right thing. So naturally the scientific method would say, okay, let's bring them all up to at least a certain adequate level. And, and then once you have, you know, I'm trying to tell this in the most positive way. You know, it, it, I think, has, has led us in the wrong direction. But, you know, once you have data, then you can go and fix the problem. What's not to like about that? Well, the problem is that the poor teachers get, you know, kind of bolted down to doing everything around standards-based testing. Again, mm-hmm. you know, it makes perfect sense. You know, I want to know if, if Susie or Johnny, you know, understands their multiplication tables. But you spend all of that time kind of, you know, any metric system, any optimization system, you end up training for the, you know, for the uh, the cost function. So you ended up spending all of this time going down to quote standards. And, mm-hmm. and what it did is it certainly probably helped bring some people up and it probably helped, you know, uh, understand where we had inadequate uh, you know, teacher training or something like that. But really, the, unfortunately, the, in the most part, uh, I saw that teachers, uh, uh, you know, were getting the brunt of this. And mm-hmm. it, it was, while it was bringing some people up, it was kind of limiting and homogenizing. I mean, standards equals homogenization. So there was some balance. We kind of went from being too loose to too tight. And uh, at the time when my kids were old enough, I, you know, I was outraged. You know, these teachers, what were they doing? You know, like, so I showed up and I said, you know, hey, I'm a scientist, or at least I play one on TV, which I did, as you know. But I, you know, can I help? Uh, you know, and I became part of my state. I live in in the People's Republic of Vermont, you know, which is mm-hmm. kind of a hippie bunch of hippies uh, kind of up here. And for about four, five, almost five years, was on the state science. Uh, uh, advisement board. And I realized just how hard it was to create something that was sort of standards based, but still went towards that point that you were on, which is allowing kids to find what they're really good at and then double down rather Mm -hmm. than homogenize, let everyone, you know, unfortunately in the limit, it also doesn't work. If you let every child pick their own path, yeah, that puts a lot of burden on people, on, on the kid, you know, to, to understand what they like at a very young age. And it also, as I found, is it puts a lot of burden on, on the, the, the teachers and the test, you know, what if you want to do some evaluation, because the more hyper personal it becomes, uh, the more work it was. So it was a really interesting balance. And I think that there is a balance. And I think that what you have to do is you have to allow a lot of latitude, a lot of variety, but you also have to figure out some way of, of not completely letting go of, of some sort of, you know, self-evaluation or standards or something. And I think actually maybe in the future that that's where tech, you know, like AI might be able to help some. But I, I really believe that in life, not just in school, that if you find that thing that really turns you on or those things and you're able to pursue them, you're a, a whole lot like more likely to be happy than if you're, you know, if you're all ground down to the same you know, form factor, you know, down into the perfectly round hole. But. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's all about finding that balance. You're right. I, I agree with you there. We can't have everyone totally homogenized like we do today, but we can't have everybody doubling down on exactly what they like. We gotta find that that perfect medium, 
Well, right. I think everybody should double down on what they want. You yeah. just have to make, how do you practically deliver that, that capability? Exactly. And I think things like, you know, Khan Academy and stuff like, I think you have to be very careful, um, you know, uh, without bringing in politics. You know, I, I think not everybody recognizes that they have the the right, they have the guidance, they have the time to be able to go out and do, do that sort of, um, you know, uh, self-actualized uh, learning. But, you know, because of the interwebs, you know, because the internet, things like Khan Academy and all the MOOCs and, MOOCs and stuff like that, yeah. you, can, you can really, really, by, by helping a, a student uh, curate, you can, you can actually find, you know, let, let him or her go deep on whatever they want. But it mm -hmm. takes some training. And actually, just the whole, I remember my father, my late father used to say, Ah, John, do whatever you want, as long as it makes you happy. And I was like, ah, what makes me happy? You know, how do you teach people to know, to, to search that out? Yeah. And yeah. I feel like, um, yeah, I, you're absolutely right. And I feel like uh, in, in a way, like, you know, technology is what makes me happy. And, and one of the reasons I even know that is because, you know, just when I was five, the, the, the sheer curiosity that I had for the world of, of technology and, and computing was just, it was just something that excited me, right? More than the other toys that I would interact with. And that's why I initially sort of got into it. That's why my dad saw that curiosity, introduced me to programming. And, and, and you're right, I, I feel like figuring out what it is that you're passionate about is important. And that's kind of, the res again, again, the responsibility of that education system. Yes. You, you know, what's interesting about that too, is that we're talking about it in kind of a one dimensional way is that, you know, you find that one thing. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I've known you long enough. Uh, I know your parents well enough, you know, that, that I, myself, my, my siblings, my kids, that there isn't always just one thing. I mean, yes. I think that that's kind of a storybook thing, you know, your, your interests, first of all, they can be varied. You know, there's the sort of I shaped person who's very deep in one thing and the T shaped person who's kind of, you know, broad and then maybe deep in a couple of things, but yeah. it also changes with time, you know, and I, I, at some point, maybe I'll talk about my career stuff, but you know, i I didn't even know how to spell AI when I was a kid, you know, and now I'm yeah. an AI yeah. guy. You know? <laughs> and, and so the, your interests, I think that we have to stop telling ourselves the myths that there is one thing that you got to get, you know, you, you know, you've got to find that passion and then you got to really dig down because the whole, the whole meta process of play allows you to make mistakes and restart and change your mind and things like that. So I think the idea of sort of embracing that and recognizing that you never have the right answer I mean, that's really intrinsic to the scientific method, but it's also intrinsic to play. I absolutely love what you just mentioned there. And the reason I love that so much is because you're totally right. And that's something that I don't even really think about all that often, right? It's, it's not just technology that excites me. Sure, on average, you know, technology or the individual things within it really excite me. But then there's also other fields like language and psychology, which, which on, on surface level don't even, you know, look remotely similar to technology, but are also equally as exciting, if not, you know, certain subfields be more exciting than certain subfields within technology, right? And so it, it, it's, you're not just finding that one thing. And I feel like that's, that's a great point to mention. And if, I, if, I, if we rewind for just a minute um, towards the beginning when, you were, when we were talking about this, you mentioned how, you know, like for example, with standardized testing, we're, we're training to the cost function, right? And, and what we ended up training wasn't exactly what we wanted from that cost function, right? So we had some sort of desire, we built the cost function, which was that standardized testing, but it turned out that the standardized testing, that cost function didn't give us exactly what we wanted because there was a shorter path to that cost function than what we wanted to take. And um, there's a great article by my mentor, Timothy Duncan. It's actually called A Tale of Two Police Departments. I'm going to put that in the chat now. Um, it's, it's a great article. And the reason that I actually bring this up is because it gives a very similar example uh, for the police and how um, the U.S. Grant Office uh, created grants to incentivize by total number of arrests made by each police department, which led to the situation that we see today. Uh, and so and, I feel you, like... Uh, uh, you ever seen Malcolm Gladwell's Talking to Strangers? You might like that because it has a not. very similar set of scenarios. Of you get what you measure yeah. Yeah. Uh, in, in policing. Sorry. I'm going to take a look at that. Thanks for mentioning. But, but basically the reason that I brought that up is because I feel like it's a very similar situation across domains, which is that, you know, we have to work from the objective backwards, not from the desired outcome forward, 
right? In order to achieve a desired outcome, you need to be really, really good at developing the incentive for people to reach that desired outcome first. You know, even with a slight discrepancy between that cost function, that objective, that incentive, and your desired outcome, you're going to get something totally different. We don't want yeah. that. Your shortcut idea, you know, that that shortcut, you get yes. unintended results. I Same mean, and that's true in optimization. You know, that's always true. It's true in AI for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we can take a look at reinforcement learning as a perfect example. There have been, you know, games where reinforcement learning will just learn to pause the game because it's like, you know, if I pause the game, I'm not losing any points. So yeah. technically, it's good. <laughs> so so there's there's all sorts of examples of this sort of stuff. Um, and, and now I kind of want to specify what we just talked about to the world of tech. And um, I, I, of course, technology is, is one of those fields where it's, um, it's not its own field, right? Technology is the kind of field that impacts every other field. It's like the infrastructure that enables every other domain to exist today, at least. Um, and, and without technology, none of the modern research that we do would be possible. Uh, and, and so I wanted to get your thoughts on how can we get kids excited about technology? Not in the sense that, of course, I mean, as you mentioned before, one field isn't for everybody. You know, technology isn't for everybody. But how can we get them excited in the sense that, you know, technology is not this exotic, you know, otherworldly thing for geniuses. It's just another thing that anybody can do. <laughs> well, I think that's a very good question, Tammy. I think part of it I think part of it is actually that you you can't present it well there's a time there's actually a time for play and a time for not play and maybe I shouldn't be playing around on your on your dime but I think the the point is that um you you have to show the joy so I I think well one thing is that you have to be able to show the possibility of joy in in the material and I think the the one way that I know, and if you stop and think, and if everybody out there stops and thinks, you know, you'll have a couple of teachers that really made a difference in your life. Mm -hmm. And probably, you know, so it might be, you know, that they were kind or whatever, but if it really struck you, their topic really struck you, it was probably something having to do with their personal passion and their excitement about it. And that's where the, the, the play out element of this comes in is that, you know, I found as I've never been a classroom teacher for more than a couple of years at a time, but I found that if you're not careful, just like we were talking about how, you know, work chases play out, if you're not, you know, if you're not mindful of that, that, mm -hmm. you know, if, if a teacher gets to a point, if we present the material, you know, 15 years into a teacher's uh, um, tenure and she or he hasn't had a chance to sort of recharge and develop passion and stay current, it's, it comes across. So I think that one of the, the the things that we really need to focus on is having teachers that can actually have playful engagement with the material and stay current and, you know, learn new things, you know, hands on. And so I think one thing that we can do is, is, is kind of focus, you know, you, again, you get what you measure, but I think a teacher's personal passion with her or his, uh, you know, material, is one of the most important things. At least when I look back to some of the, the best teachers I had, they weren't necessarily the most organized or the best groomed or you know whatever, but yeah. they were the ones that really, really loved their stuff. And there's something mm -hmm. about us as humans that sees when somebody else loves it that we lean into it. You know, so I think that I think that we've got to stop teaching, uh, treating teachers as as the bad guys here, and you know that they're yeah out, totally you know teaching is, is an act of love. It really is. And if you mm -hmm. think about it, and I hope I'm not offending anybody by saying it, but, you know, it, it requires a huge amount of, you know, technical insight and, and work. And it's, uh, there are, let's just say there are easier ways to get rich. You know, we don't, we don't pay our teachers in this country. Well, <laughs> I forget. You're not in my country, your country, I think gets it a lot better, but uh, I forgot about that. You're Canadian, aren't you? I yeah. Am. Um, but I, I would say, and I, I don't mean to, to cut down any particular country, but, you know, we sometimes think about the teachers as, you know, that's a job, you know, they should do their job, and, you know, and, and that's true, you know, they, they should be held to, to uh, high standards, but we really need to be able to, it, it, you know, invest in their engagement, their fun. I'm like currently working, I just, I'm a PI on a grant for, for uh, getting more computer science teachers in the People's Republic of Vermont. There's right now no certification, and we've just come up with a, an idea 
that the Agency of Education is, uh, is helping us with and a grant to go with it that will allow uh, teachers to get uh, 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 continuing education credit, which is something that they're required to do by helping, you know, uh, work in uh, robotics clubs and, and girls who code and things like that. So something that's fun and hands on, which they wouldn't otherwise do, they actually mm -hmm. will get credit for and maybe even mm -hmm. stipend for. So I think we have to invest in, in that. That's one thing. I think we have to invest in teacher uh, enjoyment. Um, but then I think there's some interesting aspects of technology and how education can you know, how technology can help make education more satisfying so it sticks more. Is that mm -hmm. sort of where you were going? Yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. And, and I feel like a, a good point, sorry, I'm just going to um, cut in here, uh, around, you know, making sure that teachers enjoy what they do. I've personally been to, you know, tens of schools, uh, you know, across the globe where, where I've been, you know, doing workshops for, for students and, and sort of introducing them to, te to technology. And I've interacted with a lot of the different teachers that are introducing them to technology and the vast majority of them are, are essentially learning with the students. They don't have that dedicated technology experience. And I really feel like there's a correlation here because as you mentioned, there are always some teachers in your life that have had that huge impact. Almost all of them are incredibly passionate about what they do, if not all, are incredibly passionate about what they do. And considering that the vast majority of teachers that teach like computer science aren't in computers in the first place, meaning they're not passionate about it, which kind of leads to exactly the, the problem, which is that students aren't getting excited about technology. They think, you know, this is for geniuses, this is, you know, unachievable. They think of it as this exotic other thing. And that's the kind of misconception that I wanna, that we wanna break. We wanna say that technology is just another field. Um, that's sort of where I, we're getting to. Yeah, I think that that's a really interesting thing. And I think it's not unique to technology is that I think that yeah. we over-specialize, you know, we, we have this and it goes back to the standards kind of conversation we were having is that everybody, you know, you're going to be a lawyer, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a, you know, a, a classical musician, you're going to be a basketball player. We, we have these kind of idealized life paths in our mind, you know, we personally yeah. do, our parents, first, you know, do, the schools do. And I think the actual kind of, for, you know, uh, backing off on that, I mean, one of the things that's been so fun for me, uh, over the last mm, decade is the whole maker movement. You, you familiar mm -hmm. with that term? You know, it's, yeah. it's actually kind of, if anything, plateauing. But for um, when I was your boy, you know, I grew up in Houston uh, near the space program. And, uh, you know, everybody wanted to, I wanted to be an astronaut. I was told, no, you're not good looking enough. You should be an engineer. <laughs> and, you know, that worked out great for me. Um, but uh, for a long time, there was this thing that people weren't going into STEM careers. And I kind of, you know, I want to dip back into that and actually find out what the, what the trends are. But, uh, you know, we, uh, we were, you know, there were other things that were attracting people, you know, they wanted to go into sports or what have you. But the maker movement and the things around it, which were really fueled by the kind of internet to, you know, the sort of participatory internet and things like YouTube and uh, Mythbusters and, uh, you know, uh, Maker Make Magazine, which is unfortunately, well, I think it's now coming back, but, you know, okay. that all of a sudden the fact that people were willing to share, you know, what they had actually done and it gave it kind of a fun, but it also had, you know, as, as you were saying a couple of minutes ago, it, there was an artistic element of it. There was music, you know, that tech meets music, tech meets art. Uh, mm. tech meets uh, pyrotechnics, like all the stuff that's down there. That's got the, uh, we have a safe, somewhat safe ask dad pile. And that's, you know, like I do electronics meets pyrotechnics. I mean, yeah. it's natural. The point is that mm. those fuzzing the lines and allowing people to, to sort of turn on that switch that says, yeah, I could do that. You know, I think that's a key piece. And I think that the Society today has so many tools for doing that. The participatory web, you know, things like YouTube are the best thing that's happened to people exploring their own, you know, because if you want to learn something, you want to learn how to, hey, let's make hydrogen gas and blow stuff up, you know, you go on YouTube. You know, there's all sorts of great things and all sorts of stupid things and some things that are in the middle, which are worth exploring. Like yeah. right after this, I'm going to build a one ton trebuchet for throwing flaming pumpkins. It's a great use of an MIT education, got to tell you. It is. I can tell. That that must be fun. Send me a video of that. <laughs> if we so. survive. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm sure you will. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, so, so yeah, thank you for, for your thoughts on education. And, and you're totally right. This is something where we need that, we need that personalization, right? We need to be using technology for, for helping us have our education stick more, right? That is sort of what we boil it down to. That's one thing that you mentioned that I really think is important. And I think we kind of going picking a thread back that we talked about before is mm -hmm. um, there is so much material on the web, you know, again, like Khan Academy and MOOCs and, and YouTubes and stuff like that. I think mm -hmm. what we have to teach kids earlier and teachers is, well, I think, first of all, we have to learn to curate all of that stuff. A lot of it is good. A lot of it is not good. Um, how do you, how do you, I mean, we could, one thought was, you know, the teacher needs to now become a curator. So he or she's got to spend all their time curating. But that kind of presupposes that you know what every kid's going to know. What yeah. I think we really got to do is work on the, teaching the meta skills of, so that somebody can learn how to seek this stuff out and can make their own determination. Is Does this look like good science? Is this yeah. safe? Is this? And that's um, those kind of meta skill uh uh, things are very, uh, you know, we don't really spend much time on that. Do I have I time for a short story? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So I am um, I'm very involved in something called First Robotics, which is a mm -hmm. robotics competition from, you know, Legos to somewhere in the middle to big, crazy robots. And it was started by a couple of people, Dean Kamen and a guy named Woody Flowers, uh, who passed away last year, an MIT professor uh, who was there when I was there. And um, uh he had, uh, you know, like he started the first uh, competition. You know, I, I should say, you know, I'm, I'm, I keep mentioning MIT. I don't know, is that backwards or forwards? Is that forwards? That, it's, yep, I can read it now. <laughs> yeah, so I'm the co-founder of Vomit, the Vermont's own MIT club. You know, I'm oh. totally all about MIT. I work at MIT. I went to MIT. Anyway, Woody Flowers, MIT. Um, yeah. He taught this uh, a robotic competition class from the late 70s, and you know, for 20 years. So what he did is actually uh, about 10 years ago, he actually went out and, you know, enough people had taken that class. People were lining up to take that class for a decade, for almost a decade. He went out and checked out what they had used in the world. So what they had learned at MIT and before and what they were using in their jobs. And it was really, really interesting because what he found is when, you know, like if you looked at, you know, thermodynamics, you know, uh, uh, wave theory, uh, you know, uh, differential calculus, you know, blah, 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 all of those things, what they taught, what they, then they asked what they used and what the gap was. It was all those meta skills. It was mm -hmm. things like uh, logical thinking, um, you know, uh, rhetoric, uh, uh, communication skills, you know, like uh, writing, um, uh, leadership skills, uh, those kind of things, those meta skills were spent the least time on, on at, at university and uh, you know MIT is is not your average university. I mean, it tends to trend pretty geeky. Uh, but that 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 the, the people that they asked were more concerned. You know, were using those meta skills that were spent very little time on, and only a few of the fundamental things came through. And somebody just asked me recently what the most important classes that I took were, and it was uh, I I quick I, I came back really quickly and I said calculus and improv. Those two things, you know, it was really weird as I took an improv class at MIT yeah. and that was as useful as any technical skill I have. So I think that we have to kind of bringing it back is I think we have to teach people those sort of self curation skills to be able to, you know, feed their own curiosity and then have some discernment to figure out whether this material is helping me figure stuff out or confusing me. I don't know. Just thought. That, that is really an incredible thought. You're absolutely right. I feel like we don't spend enough time on those meta skills. And I feel like terms like learning to learn are kind of overused and they don't, but I, I feel like whatever you mentioned there in terms of meta skills and meta learning, that is definitely important. Not learning to learn in the traditional sense of learning to learn, but but rather this this, this sort of sense that you've you've um, got out of it around those, those those meta skills around helping you learn how to learn most effectively, right? So and especially now that we have this embarrassment of riches, there's so much great yes. material out there, and you know everybody thinks. You kind of think like, oh, you know, if I just came up with the ultimate, uh, you know, course in differential calculus or in microprogrammers, you know, programming or something like that. 
honestly, there's so much good stuff out there. Yeah. If you can teach people how to fend for themselves and how to hunt for in, mm. in interesting information and how to be technically generous so that they actually contribute to it. I think that's a key thing is if you look at things like Wikipedia, you know, all the things that we're using, Khan Academy, et cetera, are, are examples of this great technical generosity. And I think that's another thing we can teach. It's one of the reasons I love things like first robotics because they do work on those meta skills. Mm -hmm. and, and speaking of technical generosity, there's actually another place where that applies that I want to talk about now. And that is the problem that we're all facing now. So the entirety of humanity for the first time is, is facing a single problem, COVID uh -huh. um, and the coronavirus. And, and, and what I wanted to ask you was, what's some interesting research that you've seen or applications of technology like that one that can help us with the pandemic? That's well, nice. I'm glad you asked. Thanks. My mouth is on crooked. Okay. <laughs> well, um, you know, one of the things you talk about technical generosity can you still hear me or is this totally yes i can yep i can hear you yep. so uh you know i just built this the other day because i was just tired of looking at people and going what are they saying i mean not that this really helps but it, it puts a smile on people's face and this is like one of the most yeah Ooh. smells like leds oh, um, yeah. <laughs> uh what's this is a really really difficult time, you know, that we're having to, everything gets changed. By the way, I'm enough of an anarchist that I think that that could be a really good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've seen is just this incredible rush of technical generosity, uh, uh, you know, around an immediate challenge, you know, makerspaces like um, the generator makerspace, which I helped found, we've been making PP, uh, personal protection uh, equip PPE, per personal protection equipment, um, in, you know, full swing since the, the start. All around the world, people are actually, you know, designing ventilators and designing PPE and, and figuring out how to, you know, do uh, um, distance collaboration. Everybody has kind of refocused. I'll, we can talk about some of the actual tech uh, refocusing that, that I'm seeing. But it's amazing <clears throat> to me uh, that it, it's definitely a, a scary time. But it, and, it, and it's a hard time. You know, we're, we're cut off like I haven't been able to see my kids and you know, many months. That's mm -hmm. really hard as a dad. Um, but uh, to, to think about, you know, how rigid we usually consider things, you know, like, this is what I do. You know, this is how I do it. This is where the money is going in this project. To have it, to, if you go look, and I'm sure, I'm, I'm hoping that this is the experience of many of the people out there, that all of a sudden, all rules were off and everything changed. So mm -hmm. I am now on, well, I guess I'm on three COVID related projects. And I already thought I was over busy. And, you know, it turns out that, that everybody wants to do something. Um, I do think that it's problematic because everybody in innovating it all at once doesn't necessarily coordinate to bet, you know, to an optimal solution, but that everybody's eagerness to help is also paired with everybody's sort of apparent, you know, tolerance of things breaking down. Oh, you know what? That's going to take longer. You know, those Amazon, that shipment is going to take a little bit longer, or this project's going to go out, or, you know, that big conference, we're going to do it virtually. So don't sweat it so much. We're going to move the dates out or all of this kind of things that we, we take for granted that everything is so locked and loaded. When something mm -hmm. horrible like this happens, it's amazing how flexible people can be. And I, I think I'm hoping that the, the silver lining of this really tough situation is that people take that kind of, you know, we get so worried about things and, 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 and we think about, we, we design our own boxes. We, we sort of say, you know, everything is kind of locked down. And when something external like this happens, we all of a sudden realize, no, you know, anything's possible. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you a little bit about some of the COVID projects that we're doing. Sure. Is that, I would love yeah. to hear that. Um, and these were things I had never thought about before. Uh, so one of the big uh, projects that I'm, I'm uh, most excited about is, um, so where to start? Where to start? And this is where you fade that music. I was born on a snowy day in 1959. No, um, last year, I spent a, a year uh, helping coordinate a donation of a large computer uh, called Satori, a supercomputer, GPU, uh, CPU cluster at MIT. And Satori means sudden enlightenment. It is also the name of my younger dog, 
who might walk through here at any point. But anyway, it's a fairly big, you know, it's a medi medium size uh, uh, GPU cluster, but it turns out to be the fourth most energy efficient uh, supercomputer in the world. Wow. And it is in a completely green data center. So that's another story. So it's kind of interesting how I'm, I'm looking at how you can make sure that AI doesn't become an environmental problem. That's what I was working on. Well, it turns out that this kind of GPU cluster is extremely important when you're trying to do um, uh, biochemical research. Um, and uh, you know, my our youngest son, Gabe, is a second year PhD student in biochemistry. And he's telling me about all this, you know, uh, 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 computational biology. And all of a sudden, when this thing came up, people started asking us about using our computer for a variety of things. Um, there, I, it turns out, um, I haven't even mentioned IBM. Uh, I've been at there almost, let's see, it's 39 years this year. Um, but uh, in March, just we started a, this idea of, well, hey, we've got all these supercomputers. Could we put them into service of people who are doing COVID research? And then we started going, you know, that's a good business idea, but we're not the only ones that have computers. So we started pulling in universities. And then we started pulling in, you know, who are our our otherwise uh, competitors, you know, so Google, Facebook, um, Amazon, uh, everybody's putting into this thing. We have this giant uh, high performance computing uh, COVID uh, 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 compute portal. Anybody wants to know about it, let me know. We've got over almost 60 projects that are going, that are using this wow. computationally intensive stuff. Well, our Satori computer turns out to be really good at something called cryo EM microscopy. So you've ever seen a little cute, you know, virus pictures of what COVID looks like. Yeah. It's a ball with these spikes. Well, all of those pictures are really derived from what's called cryo EM. Um, actually, four years ago, some guy, some people won a Nobel Prize for the technology. It's been around 10 years or so, but it's really hit any big. And it's essentially electron microscopy. So, you know, you're not imaging with light, you're imaging with electron beams. Um, but the samples are held at a very low temperature, you know, not super low, but, you know, 77 Kelvin liquid nitrogen kind of thing. And what that does is that it slows the, uh, the chemical movement enough and stops the vibration that by moving this thing and moving the, the beam, rel the stage relative to the beam, you could do sort of tomography. Think of it like as a CAT scan of a biological sample that's, you know, being held at a very low temperature. What well, turns out that through the wonders of, you know, essentially AI, you can recompose that image to just above an atomic level. So you can actually see molecular proteins in their mm -hmm. physical conformation. And I'm no, I'm not a biologist. I may I help make one, but, um, uh, but uh, you know, that the shape of uh, and how things conform has everything to do about, you know, how chemicals work, how medicines work, how viruses mm -hmm. work. So, it turns out that our we're spending a lot of time. I'm I'm helping a lot of people bring their um, cryo EM COVID work onto our computer, and we're just you know turning up the knobs so that they can do compute. We've been able to get uh, on on the local MIT stuff. We've been able to get a factor of 10, 10 times faster throughput, and wow. on some of the other stuff, you know, somewhere between three and ten. And it's just a matter of optimizing it's you know it's 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 a lot of just simple uh you know it's just gpu hacking you know you, you know what i'm talking about it's yeah. just just optimizing data flows and rewriting stuff and and now what we're working on is as a bunch of um there's a lot of uh, data prep aspect of like which samples you really want to double down on because each time you know it, it, these things generate we generate about two terabytes of data a day Wow. But, you know, the idea is which ones are good and which ones are bad. We're trying to automate the triage of that just using some simple uh, image recognition, you know, AI stuff. But anyway, that was something I had no idea about as of, uh, let's see, as of end of February, I'd never heard of CryoEM and now and I'm doing a lot with it. Um, you want me, can I tell you about another project? Yeah, sure, definitely. How much of this can I say? <laughs> well, um, Every, you know, everybody is is worried about, is thinking about, you know, what happens next and what happens, you know, at the end of this crisis and what happens when it happens again, because it's ultimately it will. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of work about contact tracing. You know, a lot of it's manual. You look at different countries like South Korea did a really good job of trying to figure out if somebody was infected, you know, how do you track down his or her, you know, uh, uh, 
social network to figure out, you know, who might have been. Um, but the idea is, could you, you know, how can technology help with that? And mm -hmm. a lot of people have actually come together to figure out, you know, how can things like our phones, do I have a phone? It hasn't rung. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> these things are pretty amazing. They have all sorts of stuff on them. They have, you know, radio, they have Bluetooth radios, Wi-Fi radios, they have RFID radios, they have speakers, they have microphones. So we're spending a lot of time um, working on technology uh, that would be, so a lot of people are spending time working on how governments, you know, might come together and, and you know, like Singapore, for example, had a really good example of, of you know, an app that everyone would, would use that using simple Bluetooth radios would tell whether you were too close, too long, and then would help in, a, in some sort of privacy preserving way, you know, to indicate to somebody whether you better check, get checked. Um, there are, so that kind of Bluetooth stuff, uh, you know, with trying to figure out how to do that uniformly. And I'm, again, I am a Prius driving Birkenstock wearing hippie from Vermont. So my politics are probably pretty clear, but I'm not going to talk about my politics, but I do think that it is considerably suboptimal that my, our government has chosen to, to fragment it and leave that, the decision of how this is done at a, you know, regional and state level. But, you know, the, the mm -hmm. point is, is that every, every state, every community has to figure out how to do this on their own. You have to figure out some way of doing it in a coordinated way or it defeats the purpose. One thing that's really cool is that Google and Apple have come together again in a, yes. a, in a real act of technical generosity to, to get their protocols to work together and actually in the, the, you know, in iOS and in Android to actually have some capability for that. The problem is, is that that they, you know, to their credit, they they've come together. They want to make sure that it doesn't get too out of control. So they're um, they're choosing who gets to use it in what region. The problem is, is that cities and towns and states and countries are not the only people who worry about this. Like a company like ours that has three hundred fifty thousand people, you want to know how you can bring people back to work safely. So there's a yeah. lot of issues with enterprises, universities, etc. So we're working on technology that would be used for enterprises that uses things like Bluetooth and other technologies, which I really can't go into, but trying to, to minimize the cost and maximize the accuracy of those. But it's fascinating. So I'm writing a bunch of, you know, Apple and, you know, uh, uh, Swift and, and I learned Swift through your book, Tammy. Oh, really? <laughs> really good. That's yeah. great to hear. Uh, but I'm, I'm writing a bunch of Swift and uh, now a little bit of Android code to actually test some of this stuff out. And it's super fun. Thank um, you. But I'm doing it in a misbehavior way. I probably should be paying attention to those meetings, but it's much more fun. <laughs> but cases, lots of people are dropping whatever they thought was important and working on this. And I think yeah. it's playful. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and again, it's, it's, it's about that play at the end of the day, right? It, it's about that, e even when it comes to COVID research, right? It, it's about people like us, you know, people who are excited. I mean, we were, I've actually just seen a, um, a comment on the live stream. I love his passion. It really shows. People can tell that you're passionate about what you do and, 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 and this world of technology and so much more. Um, and when, when we're passionate about this technology, I mean, what, whatever the problem is, whether it be COVID or anything else, it's, it becomes easier to solve. Now, I do have a couple more things that I want to talk about, but I also want to start bringing in some questions from the live stream. Um, <laughs> and I do want to actually start off with a pretty interesting question from Hitesh. Uh, he asks, let's just say I'm a person trying to step into data science. How do I practice with real life problems? Um, and, and his sort of issue is that um, data solutions, um, he doesn't have access to them because uh, they're not actually, he's not actually in a role, for example, in, in HR. So how do you practice data science problems without actually being in those roles? Well, I think there's two sides of that. You know, I, I really uh, honor that, that, you know, you want to go learn. That's exactly the kind of thing. You know, I, I'm hoping you're going to be doing this when you should have been doing something else. So a little bit of that misbehavior. But there's two aspects of that, I think, and they kind of go hand in hand. One is about the technology. You know, how do you actually use you know, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Scikit, learn, you know, or it depends on what you're going to do. And the other is data. Um, there are so many great tutorials out there you know my company puts a bunch of them out um there are uh, you know the tensorflow community and pytorch mm -hmm. community have huge huge uh collections of tutorials so i think the first thing would be just kind of learn to run this stuff you know and um you know 
experimenting, just getting comfortable. Like I found that when I, you know, I, I'm coming to AI fairly late. This is my fifth career, you know, and so coming you know, old dog, new tricks, I had to learn this stuff as well. I found that those tutorials that were out there, again, you had to figure out which ones were good and which one were bad. I'm assuming you're already doing that. I think the main thing is, is well, what can you do? You know, the main thing you need is data. Um, the kind of things that's very interesting is just, again, and this notion of sort of technical generosity is, is stuff like Kaggle, you know, where there are yes. these great data sets that are out there. And it's amazing to see how many people spend their, again, misbehavior time, you know, going and, and, and running these, CAG, you know, uh, kind of experimenting on Kaggle kind of challenges. Uh, I'm involved in a couple right now that are, we're not doing through Kaggle, but, um, but I think the idea of actually going out there and looking at at the, the the challenges that the people have put out there. And then if you really want to go, I, I would start with that just to be able to handle a data set and, and just sort of see how you're doing in terms of, and they can be in anything. They can be in healthcare, they can be in sociology. Some of them are just out there for fun. Some of them are mining, but then there's some really, uh, you know, big, uh, there's some commercial entities and then there's some grand prize things like we're working with the X prize on some biological challenges. Um, and that's where you would sort of go. So I think the idea is, is uh, and if anybody has trouble finding any of those resources, I'd be happy to point them, but they're really easy to find. Um, it's just so, it's kind of democratized. You know, it, it's, it's such an amazing thing that uh, so many companies have come together and made, you know, what would be their crown jewels, uh, you know, uh, available for everyone to use. And I think that same technical generosity is starting to come with data, but it's it's a little bit more problematic. One one of the topics that we're working on is how do you get companies to you know feel comfortable releasing their data, you know, kind of unprying their hands around it because you know they're worried and good. You know, you really have to be very careful about privacy. So if it has anything to do with people, you know, you have to you have to do considerable work to make sure not only is it disguised, but that it can't be de-anonymized. But then there's also how do you how do you do that in a way that doesn't give away too much proprietary value? But anyway, I think there's tons of data out there. You'll have no trouble finding it. And if you do, let me know. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's that's definitely a great way to, to, to put it. And uh, so that's that's one question. Another question actually from Amish uh, is, can we have some more specific applications of IoT, for example, um, some applications of IoT in non tech domains? Oh, gosh. Well, I don't know that I would be able to uh, get this demo necessarily together quickly, would I? Well, Let's see. I think, um, you know, IoT, so I, uh, just a real quick career story. So I told you I was born on a snowy day in 1959. At eight years old, I just wanted, wanted to go to MIT. MIT, I did device physics. Mm -hmm. And then for the first 30 years of my career, I did chip design and the software around making chips. Nice. Well, I had always been making things, you know, these are all chips up here. Um, yeah. I, uh, uh, when my company um, decided that they uh, wanted to get into Internet of Things, um, they, uh, you know, they were looking around. Let me see if I can find a, uh, a diagram of this. Um, but uh, that, um, the only uh, credentials that I had was um, that I had been making giant robotic crazy things. Uh, let's see here. Do I, don't know, do I have anything? Am I able to share screens? Uh, yes, you should be able to share your screen. I can just make sure that everybody can see it, but yeah. Mm, no, 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 no. Let's see here. Or no, uh, I would need to give you permission, but uh, there we go. You should have permission now. Okay, hang on one sec. No worries. Please hold. Your call is very important to us. <laughs> um. In the meanwhile, and one more thing that I will mention, um, there are a couple more questions coming through. So yeah, feel free to keep sending in your questions yeah. via the Well, Facebook what I was going to say, it, you know, okay. Oh, yeah, okay. Let, yeah, let me, um, how do I, how do I, uh, uh, to, how do I share? Uh, you should just be able to click the share screen button on the bottom, the green button. There yeah. we go. Uh, okay. So um, what had happened is when, you know, when we were actually getting into uh, making, 
going into Internet of Things, you know, you had asked about what were the what, what were the sort of non uh, practical. I don't remember what the question was, but um, I had been asked a couple of years ago. Uh, and I, I'm trying to think about how to. Yeah, so uh, as part of Vomit, Vermont's own MIT club, I mentioned before, um, we were asked to try to build a, uh, a seven meter tall sculpture that was uh, used for scaring children, which is a really okay. good use of an, I, an MIT education. But it was basically remote controlled. It was a first wired controlled. Now it's wirelessly controlled. It goes from two meters high up to seven meters high. And as you talk, it moves around. It's still around. It's called Project X. And then the, like this thing over here on the right is also seven meters tall, but it was a giant, uh, what this was the the electronics, the, the that's my brother, the, um, the lighting on there was remotely controlled. It was an IoT device. And when my company decided to get, and it, it's just for carrying half naked hippies across the desert in Nevada at Burning Man. When the company decided to get into IoT, you know, no one in the company had a, that much of a portfolio. This is what I had. And they said, ah, you can, uh, you know, why don't you, uh, uh, why don't you come here? And by the way, you can run it. And so they, they took me to Munich and uh, so, <laughs> For two and a half, two over two and a half years, I ended up commuting back and forth to Munich, uh, where our IoT center was, which was really fun. So I think that IoT can be used for all sorts of things. It can be used for entertainment. It can be used for um, uh, obviously healthcare. Um, my oldest son, our oldest son Max, works at a place called Meow Wolf, and it's just this incredible indoor experience. You know, kind of an amusement experience for all you know for all ages. It is a hundred percent IoT. Very IoT nice. can do a lot of play, and in the course of doing the play, I guess my main message was: by playing, I had actually done the portfolio that got me uh, one of the best jobs I've ever had. That is that is incredible to hear, and and like what you mentioned around uh, again, it boils back down to that play that we were mentioning in the beginning, right? So, so IoT can be used for for all sorts of things, and 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 those were some practical and non-practical applications at the same time. Uh, now there is a, a question that I want to ask you. This is something for me, and and then I'm going to ask you the actual question, um, which is on similar lines, but it's different uh, from the live stream. Uh, and I understand everybody on the live stream that that knows about this stuff that this question doesn't make a hundred percent sense. This is from my side, um, but let's just say, John, for you, just just something that I'm curious about around CPU architectures. If you had the choice, and assuming that you know all the software that you usually use, you know whatever it is that you want to do runs on both architectures, would you rather have a a Mac or Windows? Whatever, I don't care about the operating system. Would you rather have a computer with an x86 chip, like an Intel or an AMD, or an IBM Power chip? and why? What applications of yours would run better on either? I'm not programmed to respond to that. <laughs> uh, um, I think there are different courses for different courses. Yes. So um, I would say that um, I'll answer it that way, if even if it's intentionally ev evasive. <laughs> I'll say that, you know, you have to be flexible in your mind. And, you know, again, like choosing a career, you have to be able to choose the tools that are there. Yeah. I want to use the tools where where all the cool kids are, because, you know, the ability to actually collaborate on on a base where a lot of other people are on. Sometimes it's yeah. easier to do it on one or the other. So, you know, like on microcontrollers, you know, I've got a pile of Raspberry Pi kind of things, and I have a whole bunch of ST, uh, you know, uh, ST chips here. I have a whole bunch of and uh, you know, um, Adafruit stuff. You you have to use you have to be flexible enough to learn the tool that you want to use. Um, I will tell you that the the power chips that we use for you know like for Satori, um, it's it's not just it's it's the systems architecture that we have a terrible a terabyte of memory on each of these 64 nodes. And wow. if you can figure out how to, you know, divide your problem into a thing that will actually utilize that along with the, the, the GPUs that we use, uh, there's nothing like it, but you know, it's, 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 it's like, uh, you know, you have a, a one bicycle for trails and you have one bicycle for yeah. the road, you know, using one for the other is, is not always great. So it's really important to, to actually use things that where they're good. 
Yeah, I, I feel like kind of my, my question was actually, uh, it was worded in a d bit of a different way, but what I really kind of meant was the kind of problems that you solve on a daily basis with your technology, are those, are they more suited for the kind of power chips that you would use or Intel chips? But I but I, I get what you're saying there. Well, I would uh, say uh, like the, the cryo EM work that we're doing, yeah. you know, the fact that these large memory models make all the difference, you know, that's mm -hmm. where we're getting, you know, three to 10x improvement because- yeah. You can you can fold the I/O in, you know, you you can sort of batch that asynchronously and then do a lot of calculations in memory that you don't have to go and fetch off of a disk. I mean, nothing nothing speeds it up faster than that. So interesting. Uh, so those are the those are the kind of things. I think the the way I would turn it around in my evasive answer would be, um, you know, you have to really understand the tools that you're doing, hardware, software, people, you know, and yeah. use them for what they're really good at and to do that you have to really learn what they're good at and what they're not so good at so agreed agreed that makes a lot of sense and and sort of getting into the actual question and i question. completely avoided the answer answering the question <laughs> <laughs> well you won't be able to avoid this one um so the question is well maybe you could but um uh, some subhap subhatra uh asks people keep on saying mainframes are gonna die ibm maintains uh that mainframes are here to stay what's your take on this oh this is an easy one so okay. it's really interesting. Um, I do a whole talk on reinvention, but um, the um, uh, the mainframe has been about to disappear uh, for the last forty years that I've been working. <laughs> so, um, and what happens is, I think that if if technology doesn't evolve, it it does go out, and and there is a tendency if you're not careful to cling to something too long. So there is it's a really valid question. Um, and just to say, hey, I'm using it because I used to use it, that's a recipe for going out of business. Mm -hmm. What's very interesting about uh, mainframes, and I'll just use IBM mainframes, is that that the, the concept of what they were designed to do is to sort of centralize and, um, you know, centralize compute. Uh, it, they're very different. The mainframes that we have today, like Linux One stuff, is is very, very different than the old machines that we had. But in terms of virtualization, in other words, how much compute can you get per cubic meter per watt? There is absolutely nothing that can touch them because they're engineered for that. Um, you know, they're not, again, they're not perfect for, you would not want to write your, you know, your small JavaScript, you can run JavaScript on it, but you wouldn't, that's not what they're for. But if you have a large enterprise uh, 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 data load, you know, it's a lot of databases and stuff like that, there is no better platform. That platform, it's growing. It's growing quickly now. And it's because it runs Linux. You know, actually, when you log into, a, you know, one of those Z things, it's just like, it's like logging into a data center, but it just happens to be, you know, only a few racks. And so it's, um, uh, I think that if you cling to an idea that, you know, the mainframe is, you know, that's the wrong thing. If you sort of say, I kind of think it comes back to some of what we were talking about, what the objective is. If the objectives is, you know, throughput per cubic volume per watt, then the, the, the object and you drive that objectives, which is it's actually throughput per cubic meter per watt per dollar or, you know, whatever currency is that uh, as long as that, that they actually for for certain types of really, really important workloads, there's nothing close because Think about the opposite. Think about a data center where you've got lots of white label racks that each one has a power supply, each one has a disk, each one has a communication stuff. They're not designed to be working in, in high volume. Now, the nice thing about that scale out thing is that you can always add more capacity and it's very easy. But for if you're trying, if you have a certain set load and you can decide how you're going to actually put it into into some into these mainframes and it, it fits the software pattern um the amount of, of throughput you can get per per volume and watt and dollars there's no no comparison but it's mm -hmm. you know again it's horses for courses so yeah, yeah they're going to be around for a long time I agree, and I feel like uh, so. Tim, Tim Duncan in the chat answered that as well. Uh, maybe, maybe um, you should ask a banker if they plan to move off of them. Uh, that might be a better person to ask. 
because um, IBM's going to keep building them as long as keep, people keep buying them. And as you yeah. mentioned, John, there's there there is a valid reason. You know, mains. I I agree with the with the notion that I mean I haven't been around for forty years, but I can say that for as long as I've been hearing about mainframes, I've also been hearing the connotation associated with them that you know they're going to die soon, but that doesn't ever come. So well, I think it's a matter. I think the the meta lesson here, Tan May, is about reinvention, and it's just the same thing that 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 technology has done that we personally have to do. You know, like mm -hmm. I, I said, I was a chip guy, then I became an IoT guy, now I'm an AI, AI guy. If you just keep trying to do the same thing again and again and again, you end up kind of, you know, leveling off. So you have to continue to re-engineer yourself and you have to re-engineer the technology. I mean, I, I can think of cases where, you know, where you can just, if you, artificially try to re-engineer, just relabel the technology, and it doesn't actually optimize on the objectives, then then the world will see through that. This just happens to be that the objectives that we're on. And it's interesting, I think, um, is this an okay conversation? Yeah, I mean, one interesting thing is that there was a tendency to say, okay, no, you know, we've got to hold on to the, the very proprietary way that the software works, because there's a lot of people, you know, every, you know, most banks, most insurance companies, most airlines, they still use these, you know, thing, these uh, machines for the reasons we were just talking about. But they also want to be able to make use of Linux and, you know, the, the sort of modern software stack. And so there was a lot of, you know, kind of uh, friction in the company at one point on, you know, do we do we jump on board? And we, we're a huge contributor to Linux. Yeah. Um, and when that all of a sudden, you know, when you can run the software stack that you want and still get that that huge uh, computational uh, density advantage, um, then that barrier goes away. So you have to be careful about just hanging on to things because they're yours versus hanging on to them because they have value. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a lesson you always learn. And again, applicable in our own lives too. Absolutely, absolutely. On the surface, it might seem like you know people are hanging on because it's legacy, um, but really, if you take a look at it, there is reinvention going on, you know, behind the scenes and oh. in front of them too. Yeah. Um, so another question that I see from Tim Duncan here: If you were asked to build a twelve-channel dry electrode EEG solution that could stream data to your iPhone, what would your strategy be for solving that problem? Wow. Well, I would take a. I would go back and 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 really tweak up my my analog sensing uh, stuff. You know, it's funny. Um, I have two EEGs somewhere back here, oh, and yeah. and the the the, the operate, uh, operative word there is dry electrode because it turns out that the signal to noise stuff of you know usually you put goo, and, yeah. and it's uncomfortable. But the Not idea, fun. like I have a Nicomimi, you know, a toy hat that the ears are supposedly you know, actuated by EEG, it's more like uh, EMG, if you take, you know, like your jaw yeah. muscles. But um, uh, here would be a way I would do, well, first of all, I would go back, you know, really study up on your, um, on your analog sensing, because this is all about signal to noise. And then, um, so here's an interesting analogy, though, is I've started to, to get more involved in the, the combination of AI and IoT which is what drove me to this job. Um, obviously, you know, you need to get the signals, right? But more and more, so my, my inclination would be lean more heavily on the data science part than you would normally have. So if I think about it, a lot of, you know, analog sensing, so my background's analog. And, you know, you could spend a lot of time trying to get just huge precision and really quiet circuits, which you, you sort of need to do for something like that application. But it turns out that if you can just get the data out there, that there's signal processing. You know, think about was it last year that the, that that team led by the MIT woman found an image of a black hole using incredibly noisy data gathered from a whole bunch of different places, but then used AI to go in and sort of do a guided search of all this noise which was a very different take on on doing signal processing, right? So it's sort of like, I know what I'm looking for rather than try to clean it up and then look. So mm -hmm. it's, you know what I mean? And I suspect that if somebody had the disciplines, you know, the big problem that sometimes we have in things like this is that there's disjoint disciplines. That there's somebody who knows analog signal process, you know, analog design and it's signal processing very well. And then there's somebody over here who knows the AI and data science. My guess is that if you can get enough overlap, 
you probably could do by, uh, you know, you, using uh, kind of like autocorrelation kind of things in AI that you would be able to pull the noise out and, and, and quiet it down quite a bit more. I'll bet you'd be able to, especially if you know the kinds of shapes that you're looking for, you could build kind of a, you know, a, a maybe like an autoencoder kind of thing that would, mm -hmm. would pull the noise out. So I would, I would really pair up whichever of those skill sets you have, I'd pair up with the other one. I think that that would be really cool. It'd be great. There's an open EEG project that I've used. I once uh, had, let's see, I've built an EEG that ran a musical instrument, sort of like the theremin that I showed you, uh, mm -hmm. but only it was EEG. And I built an EEG that ran flamethrowers. All my flamethrowers are over there. Um, and that's something, the problem is making an EEG, which is noisy, drive a flamethrower is kind of an interesting safety problem. Um, so I think that if, uh, you know, if you could actually crack this problem, create a dry electrode thing that actually had good data science in it, it would be incredibly popular in the arts world. I mean, you, you better be, uh, you better be really calm when you're controlling a flamethrower with EEG. That, that's, that's exactly the problem. <laughs> it's like, whoa, I did it with it. You know, it turns out I did it with an EKG, you know, a heart thing. And that was oh, much yeah. more predictable. So Interesting. It would go yeah, I've been yeah. working on some some interesting heart um, heart based projects, and, and you're right. You know, using using machine learning technology to be able to do the signal processing as well yeah. is a huge leg up, rather than always looking for a very very precise signal. Yeah, a needle. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You just create a needle like filter. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. So from there, another interesting question I see is nowadays it seems to not be enough to know only one technology or framework. So is there any possibility in the future to have a kind of universal language which will integrate with any domain? And before you answer that question, I do want to sort of talk, um, I, I want to give you a little, so another, I'll attach my own question to that as well. Um, and that is, I want to get your thoughts on compiler technology and specifically, not, not necessarily the compilers themselves, but rather how they tie into the work that we do. I mean, I, I can say personally from experience um, that uh, compilers play a much larger role in developing all sorts of software than lots of developers realize they do. Um, right, and so like, for example, we could take a look at things like um, Clang and how Clang ushered in this new sort of era of compiler technology with the LLVM backend enabling compilers to be modular for the first time ever and enabling C, Swift, Julia, and Fortran, and Ada, and Kotlin to all benefit from the same optimizations. That's incredible. Um, and, then, and then from there, uh, now thanks to, thanks to that... Um, Thanks to that um, sort of innovation within compilers, we've got projects like the Swift for TensorFlow project enabling you know, compilers with machine learning ability built into them so that developers can write code that's super, super simple, but even faster than Python code. Uh, and also just another thing that I'll say really quickly, by the way, this question was initially asked um, by, let's see here, the, the, the question was asked by Ram. Uh, and, and so another thing that I want to um, sort of append to that is that when it comes to um, compiler technology like this, we, we see languages like Python are already you know, huge within the machine learning field. I feel like unlike mainframes where there's some reinvention happening, which is why people are still on the platform because there's a genuine reason to be. With languages like Python, it's simply because legacy code, right? There's no real reinvention happening within the Python field for people to still be on Python. The future is in languages like Swift and Julia, which Julia I know is being worked on MIT as well. Yeah, as a matter of fact, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. I, I, I'm trying to remember where the course of the, what the top of the question was. But. Yeah, no worries. But I was actually just about to get back to that. So the top of the question from Ram was, uh, it seems like nowadays you, it's not enough to just know a single technology or framework. So is there a possibility in the future to have sort of like a universal language which will integrate with any domain? So I want to get your thoughts on that. And then after that, I want to get your thoughts on that compiler tech as well. Well, it's interesting. I, uh, I know this is kind of maybe getting repetitive, but I would say that uh, there are different, you know, different horses for courses kind of thing is that I think it, while it may be really appealing to have one language that rules them all, I think that the, uh, the types of things that we do, you know, there's always this balance between uh, uniformity, you know, and, and generality and, 
and and speed of development. So you're, you're exactly right. I mean, who would have thought that Python would have been the answer? You know, like what? You know, it's indentation and all that stuff. But you know, because it had these really good you know vector math. You know, why not? Or JavaScript. You know, like I showed you that that theremin it was written in JavaScript. It's great for doing graphic stuff. Python's terrible at that. Now, would I like to do all of that stuff in one language? Yeah, but I think that the the fact you know that you're always battling, you know, what's new, what people are trying to do, and if you try to if you try to unify things that much. There's kind of a sphere. It, 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 it's harder. It's harder to coordinate because people are trying to do too many things at once. I, I mean, I think that there are elements of a language that, you know, like the back end, like the LLVM mm -hmm. stuff. Maybe we could create unified back ends that actually did made the code generation and the portability and all of that stuff easier. But I think that there are different, you know, software paradigms, you know, some things like you know, if you're working on tensors, you want to write about it in a certain way. If you're writing about graphics objects, you're doing it in another. If you're doing it in graphs, maybe another. So I, while I, you know, what's not to like about one language for everything, I think that we spend too much time thinking about it. You know, honestly, I mean, there, there's an element of training. And I would say we spend too much time thinking about that because I think if you know the meta objects and you've got, you know, if you have to do a couple of languages, we could spend a lot of time and probably end up giving away some optimality just to sort of make something that's already easy enough easy. I know that sounds kind of crotchety, but like, you know, hey, look, I don't mind having two different languages or three different languages in my toolbox. It's really knowing how to formulate it. And if the the language helps me write what I'm doing concisely, you know, it was very interesting, the experience about Julia, and I'm not a, a Julia expert, but you know, we were trying to get Julia running on Satori on the, on the power cluster. And so um, started learning more about it. And I'm not exactly sure why people are choosing Julia for a lot of these um, Bayesian, you know, like Gen and things like that. So these Bayesian systems, but there's some paradigm in language that makes that easier. Well, I really want to learn the Bayesian stuff. So I'm learning Julia. So, I mean, I don't really mind. I think it make the problem is you can spend a lot of time making something that's not the big problem easier and you end up spending a lot of time doing that. I, I, so I'm, I'm not, I'm kind of crotchety. I, I don't mind learning new languages. And I would just say that the, the paradigm, you know, if history is any, any indication that, you know, languages tend to come from a particular problem domain. And yes. again, it's like, what are you trying to optimize for? Make it e easy and concise and, and uh, you know, better yet, make it easily formalizably uh, verifiable and, you know, provable and, and, and aim for things like reuse. Obviously having the same language helps in reuse, but, um, but, you know, work on those constructs. And then I don't mind learning another language. I think that the, history would would show you you know what esperanto was supposed yes, to be yeah yes. so i think the idea that people who want to unify things just for the sake of unification while it's a you know laudable goal it tends to not be the people who are actually coming up with the next new problem the problem is is you'll converge around something then somebody will have a different paradigm i don't know i'm enough mm -hmm. of a utopian that i i'm open to that next new language but i'm also enough of a pragmatist to say yeah, but if it doesn't work, I'll go learn another language. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, we, again, what you mentioned around languages coming out of some sort of necessity to optimize for something, that makes so much sense. And I feel like the perfect two or even three languages to highlight that would be Go, Swift, and Julia. And the reason those three languages are so good is because they are all very specifically optimized for specific use cases. Some are more general than others, right? So for example, Go is very, very fine-tuned, right? Down to the runtime on which Go programs are run for concurrency, right? So like when you launch a Go routine, you're not launching a thread, you're launching a Go routine. And the Go, Go runtime scheduler is handling actually running those, those Go routines instead of the operating system, the kernel. You know, Go is very, very fine-tuned to that concurrency and it's very good for what it does. Um, as a matter of fact, I mean, this, this application that we were talking about towards the beginning where we went from, you know, the SHA-256 brute force hashing, you know, um, my, my friend Omer was working on a Go implementation like two days before I was finished a C implementation that got to 60 million hashes per second. He was already there with Go. And that's just because Go was built for concurrency, right? It's, it's yeah. easy to write concurrent co code in Go because it was built for that. 
of course use that for all our hyperledger or blockchain stuff we're using. exactly that's that's exactly the point of that. And then when you take a look at something like C, which is more general purpose, but low level, then obviously you're gonna get better performance than Go, but the, all the extra time for engineering and all the extra you know, low maintenance, I mean, because C is so much more high maintenance, it's not really worth it. Whereas Swift you know, is, is very, very specifically targeted towards you know, all sorts of use cases. It's more general purpose, but it was initially built for iPhones and mobile devices. Is it used for iPhones. anything else? I mean, I, oh, you yeah. were the first person who made me think about Swift as a language other than for, for iPhones. I mean, yeah, I mean, Swift I, is I just used found everywhere. that it's, yeah, it's so much simpler than using Objective-C for me. You know, exactly. I, I, I do mostly hacking and I just found that it's been incredibly uh, yeah. enabled to do that. That's exactly you know, the point of Swift. Here's, here's an interesting angle, though, that you look at languages like Java and stuff like that that kind of evolved, you know, during the time of, well, what people call Moore's law, you know, we call it Denard's law because Bob Denard actually came up with the physics of it. But the idea that chips kept getting faster. So we kept making languages that had higher and higher abstractions, but deeper and deeper call stacks. Um, I do think that as compute performance is kind of leveling out, that we're going to have to start leaning back towards things like Go that get more, you know, there's so much fat in, you know, if you look at the call stack of Hello World in Java, you know, oh, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, the idea of sort of reclaiming some of that and actually making things fast, mm -hmm. you know, that's one of the things I always think is really cool about Julia is, you know, they seem to have, you know, they, they seem to have gotten kind of an interesting balance on performance. Or, or exactly. Go. And also, I mean, I feel like Julian specific, and I was just about to get to that, is, is that, you know, with, um, with Julian, the way that it works, its compiler is so flexible that you can even write compiler extensions from within Julia. Your program can modify the way Julia will read your program so that you can achieve certain tasks or get it to do certain things. It's, it's really incredible what sort of technology you have there. Um, and, and, and the importance of that is that we can write more complex code faster and still have it run just as fast. And that's where yeah. all sorts of things come in from there. You know, there's, there's things like MLIR, which all sorts of, you know, f you know, there's all sorts of things that fill in that acronym, but one of them is multi-level intermediate representation. Um, and that's part of the LLVM project now. Uh, and what MLIR does is it enables, you know, like LLVM enabling all sorts of languages to share optimizations. Now it's enabling all sorts of intermediate representations to share optimizations. So if you go from Swift to SIL to, um, to, to LLVM to assembly, or if you go from Rust to Rust's first intermediate representation, that another, then LLVM, then assembly, all those intermediate representations can share optimizations, even tensor optimizations. Um, and so that, that sort of sharing across languages is going to be really important in the future. Having languages that are slimmed down, not like Java, super you know, clunky and, and built for a time where you know, chips are getting faster and faster, um, that, I feel like that's really important. And, and again, languages like wonder, Julia and Swift are going to help there. I wonder, you know, hearing you talk about it, I've, I've never really thought about this, but the, the, like the LLVM you know, intermediate levels becoming a way, you know, one, one objective of having one language to rule them all is so that you can reuse things together, obviously. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that there would ever be a place where the back, end, you know, where reuse could actually happen deeper in the stack that you write in the, the language paradigm that's most convenient to you or most familiar to you. And then all the linkage and stuff like that could be done, you know, more cleanly and more efficiently uh, buried, you know, buried in the back end. I don't know. I'm not a soft, I'm not a compilers guy, but I, I really, you know, I, I think the idea of, of being able to optimize uh, better like that is is incredibly. Yeah. Important. yeah. I must say, the first time I started getting into compilers and saw all these compiler optimizations, it was kind of magical to see how like you would create like a factorial function, right? And you would print out the factorial of five and you actually inspect the binary and you're like, you don't see the call of factorial anywhere because the compiler's already put the answer in the print, right? It's, it's already calculated the factorial and put it there for you with constant folding. So um, these optimizations are pretty magical and, and just that seeing, in fact, it's actually gotten so good to the point that when you tell the compiler to forcefully inline your functions or put a certain variable in a register instead of memory, you're making your code slower because the compiler knows the code better than you do. And you shouldn't be giving it that information, which is why 
Sometimes, a little bit of a side note, languages like Julia or Swift can be slightly faster than C because there is that extra layer of abstraction, enabling the compiler to understand the structure of your program to optimize it better than you could in C. But, you know, regardless of all that, the, the point is, to get back to your question, Raj, um, or uh, Ram, um, that, that there doesn't need to be a universal language for everything. Rather, we should look at a universal backend enabling all those specialized languages to share features and share optimizations and work instead of reinventing the wheel everywhere. And so now I do have one more question for you uh, before we continue. Um, and from there, if we do have any more questions from the live stream, we'll go ahead and answer those. Otherwise, uh, we, will, uh, we will continue later. And the question is, uh, you mentioned when we were talking about your, your research into COVID that you are working on like green AI, so like energy efficient AI. Um, and could you maybe expand a little bit more upon what that means? How, how are you yeah. making AI more energy efficient? Well, uh, I think everybody has to do their part. So one of the things, you know, uh, how people think about AI is very interesting. I just uh, finished a year on a task force for the state of Vermont on, you know, what AI, how would we maximize the benefits and minimize the impact? And I was really surprised to see how much fear there was in misunderstanding. Uh, but also legitimate concerns. You know, most people are worried about things like Skynet. And I'm like, you know, no, we should be worried about things like privacy right now. You know, yeah, yeah that's something to worry about later. Um, so I was a little bit kind of reluctant to get into trying to sell another problem. But turns out that if you think about uh, especially supervised learning, you know, if you're, if you're doing a bunch of supervised learning, it's very, I think a lot of people know that it's very computationally intensive. You run a lot of data, you run a lot of cases, you do a lot of hyperparameters, and you start spending a, a fair bit of energy. And especially if you're using these big GPU clusters, they take a lot of energy. Well, the way I kind of, that became an interesting problem to me is, is we built Satori, this cluster. Um, it was a donation, you know, it was something that IBM was, uh, was providing to MIT. And as we were doing the benchmarking, because uh, last November, twice a year, supercomputer, uh, lists all the top 500 supercomputers. Mm -hmm. And then they list in something called the green 500, how those computers are at converting, you know, watts to uh, flops or tensor flops. And um, we were kind of surprised that our machine uh, came out number four and uh, right behind uh, another IBM power machine at, at uh, Rensselaer called Amos, and right ahead of Summit, which is the world's largest computer right now, mm -hmm. and LANL, which is the next one. So there were a bunch of these IBM, uh, and it's really a systems architecture thing because of memory and a variety of other things that, in terms of like on benchmarks like Linpack, that our machine was incredibly energy efficient. What was interesting more on that, so we were the fourth most efficient in, uh, computer, which is nice, but we actually uh, uh, are co-located in something called the Mass Green High Performance Data Center. It's in Holyoke, Massachusetts. It's an old brownfield site. It's an old manufacturing site, and they've re they've cleaned up the entire uh, facility, uh, built a, a new uh, uh, state-of-the-art uh, data space in it and 97% of the energy into it is, is renewable. It's mostly hydro, some nuclear. But the combination of having an energy efficient computer in an energy efficient building, that all of a sudden we have by far the most energy efficient computer in the world. Now, that alone is, it's interesting, but what we've decided to do is use it as kind of a pulpit. I mean, it'd be easy to say, you know, look, the solution to this problem is go build yourself a new energy, you know, energy efficient compute. But honestly, I think the main thing you got to do is you, we need to change the way we do it. We need to move away from pure supervised learning to semi-supervised, unsupervised. You know, our brains are only 20 watts. Uh, the computer that I'm talking about is 250 kilowatts. You know, there's got to be some gap that, you know, there's a lot of, of room to optimize. Well, how do, we, how do we make sure that, you know, that there are some projections right now that by 2030, AI will be a substantial part of the energy budget of the world if we don't change gears well we've got to change gears and the only way to change gears is to give people insight so when people run on our computer um they can they can get power information back that says you know if i do option a or option b which one is more 
let's let's not talk about power. Let's talk about carbon as a as kind of a you know uh, energy made Rio, right? From a climate mm-hmm. standpoint. So we started to actually, you know, uh, one, one calculation we did is that if you actually looked at the LINPAC calculation that we use for benchmark, but everyone has to use for the same benchmark for compute. If you ran that kind of workload for a year on our system versus a comparable, you know, just take something else off the list. We're sort of in the middle of the top 500, you know, take, take something comparable in a normal data center with a normal mix of, of renewable and non-renewable. So uh, let's see if I remember the numbers. I think that if you, a standard, to the extent that you can standardize something like that, a standard uh, computer of about that capacity in a, in a normal compute thing would take about almost 300 maple trees worth of carbon to run. So wow. put that in a second. We are under, we're about four maple trees. So when you actually give somebody feedback that this decision, you know, that you made is better, that this algorithm is far better, that all of a sudden you start to care. I mean, when you think about, you know, just being able to get feedback on, you know, the carbon cost of your air travel or anything like that, we're not trying to green shame anybody, but we're trying to say, you know, you don't, again, going back to metrics, what we were talking about with education, you don't optimize anything if you don't know what it is and there's no quote cost to you. So what we're trying to do is let people see what what actually can happen. And I think that there's so many cool technologies out there, like, you know, like the Bayesian stuff, you know, is so much more energy efficient if, if that we can start to favor it and start to optimize. We can get better. We can use, you know, different kinds of uh, hyperparameter tuning rather than just shotgun. Mm-hmm. We had a uh, we had a um, hackathon and where we would actually, you know, ask people to go and try to speed up or green up, which is usually the same thing, their their stuff. And there were like 8x, 10x improvements just by being able to observe it. Uh, and it's going to be, you know, this isn't going to be an easy thing to fix, but we just need to steer it so that it doesn't become an environmental problem. So we have a great pulpit, if, for lack of a better word. I feel, I feel like what you mentioned there around the system architecture itself, sort of working towards that, uh, a, a bigger part of that is, is the CPUs themselves, right? And the CPUs and the GPUs and the, and the main processing units. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and specifically, I mean, one of the reasons that I would assume that um, IBM systems happen to be, you know, some of the most green ones would be that compared to x86, you know, simpler instruction set, you know, less energy required to do the same amount of computation on like a power chip versus an Intel chip. So I feel like the transition to things like, you know, risk five and power and ARM are gonna help us, you know, maintain high performance, but at the same time get greener technology. And final two questions, these are gonna be quick. Well, I just wanna, just, yes. just, just to make sure that this doesn't get missed is, while everything you said is true, um, I think hardware is just a component. So, mm-hmm. I mean, if we continue to do, you know, tons of supervised learning with huge hyperparameter sets, doesn't matter whether I mean, it does matter. You want to use the most efficient hardware you can. Where I think it's really going to change is that our software formulations Mm -hmm. and how they run on the hardware is going to be the big thing. So uh, while I think it's great to work on the energy efficiency of the compute, I think it's equally great, maybe more great to work on the formulations because, you know, to make those more energy efficient also means making them more time efficient. So Absolutely, absolutely. Which, in a way, can can be considered a pretty difficult problem. I mean, being able to balance the performance in terms of accuracy, but at the same time, performance in terms of time and the energy efficiency is something that right. you know, taking that extra factor into account. Developers' lives are already complex enough as it is. Taking that extra factor into account makes it more complex. Um, yeah. But now, really quickly, we're just going to do like a kind of rapid fire here. Uh, a question for you about neurosymbolic reasoning is something that I'm really interested in. And uh, I mean, I feel like there. Two sides to one of the debates in AI, where a lot of people either believe that you need these sort of combinations of deep learning and symbolic reasoning techniques to be able to learn complex relationships and patterns, and those who believe that you could just use like modeling techniques like GT, GPT or, or transformers, and as long as you have enough parameters, it'll learn whatever you want it to learn. I personally am on the camp um, that believes you know we we got to have some sort of symbolic learning combined with deep learning to learn these complex patterns. But what do you think about that? What is that technology about? I'm actually of two minds. So basically the, you know, what's interesting is compute, you know, AI has been around, I guess the first time it was mentioned was 1956 at the the Dartmouth uh, 
uh, workshop on artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. A bunch of AI, you know, IBM people, a bunch of MIT people, a bunch of AT&T people, uh, Rob Bell at that time. Um, and, you know, of, of those AI winters, there's always been this promise of, you know, well, eventually symbolic logic, you know, rules-based AI, uh, expert systems would actually do it. And, and you know, that on, on itself just proved to be too complicated and too fragile. Um, when, and even though the the sort of perceptron work and neural nets and stuff like that have been around for almost, you know, 50, 60 years, there wasn't, it wasn't until the mid, well, like 2012, you know, when people started using GPUs, 2015, when the software started to work out and then all of a sudden everything took off. I think it's been sort of like, that's the hammer and everything looks like a nail and it's just such a good resilient technique um I, you know our mind is that our mindset is that you can use the, the the strengths of the neural network to sort of uplift to symbolically uplift and de-render you know uh uh you know what a scene has what a conversation has what a um, uh everybody say hi to my mom um that uh you know that we can figure out some way of uh uh, uplifting or parsing the world. And then if you're going to try to, you know, answer questions about it, arbitrary questions that you've never, you know, you aren't training on, you know, that it's much easier to pull that in and then use, you know, formal symbolic, you know, symbolic logic to be able to answer those. Now, ultimately, where does that go? So I think the idea of being able to do that, be able to uplift into the symbolic and then reason around the symbolic, optimize around the symbolic, reuse off around the symbolic is a really good way to get going. I mean, ultimately, I do think that eventually, you know, our brains only have, we think, only one set of wetware, right? But it's 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 architected into different structures of sort of fast and slow. I think that eventually, you know, the implementation might actually be more uniform. But as a way of actually gaining traction on our understanding, the explainability, um, the uh, extensibility, the reusability, uh, and transparency. That, that, you know, having a symbolic handle on what is actually, you know, de-rendered from the world is going to be, is going to really help us understand and make, you know, make progress towards things like general AI. So, so I think if nothing else, it's a very pragmatic approach to making advances. And our, our uh, indication so far is, is, is it's, you know, it really gives you a lot more insight into what's going on just by decomposing problems and being able to, you know, reason through it, follow the, the logic of, of the decisions that are being made. Mm -hmm. Interesting to hear. And so now that was the final question. Let's see if you have any other questions. We are still going to be on for a couple minutes. Feel free to send those in through the YouTube or Facebook live chats. But now, though, John, it's it's been uh, quite some time. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Those are really insightful. Before we end off today, I do have a question for you. Now, the Tech Life Skills audience is incredibly diverse, right? We've got all sorts of people. We've got developers. We've got you know executives. We've got all sorts of people, um, students, everyone. So. Do you have a sort of closing message for the audience before we go today? Yeah, I think I do. Um, you know, we've talked about play and we've talked about keeping your hands dirty, you know, getting your hands dirty and working on, you know, making time to misbehave. I think the main lesson, and this is one that I, I have to keep reminding myself, is about worry, you know, Worry is the opposite of play, you know, where you spend so much time thinking about, you know, um, we, we, we get ourselves so balled up that we have to get the right answer. We have to figure out how we're going to teach our kids. We have to figure out what computer language we're going to learn, blah, 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 blah. Um, and um, society tries to get us to decide things. And the point is, is that there is often not enough data to decide. Yet we, we sort of paint a picture of the future that is so, you know, we can calculate, we can say like, you know, if I don't get, you know, if I don't get this project done, then I won't get that contract. No, I don't get the contract. I won't get the promotion. If I don't get the promotion, I won't get the salary. I won't get the salary. I won't get married. Blah, 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 I won't have kids. I'll end up living in a ditch. And boom, you know, you just end up running this forward and things like COVID really, you know, kind of play to that. You know, it's like, oh my God, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Well, the, you know, as I found out through some of the hardest ways imaginable that, you know, Life is completely unpredictable, but the things you worry about generally are not the things that happen. And I'm, it's not a fatalistic way, but it's just that we, we spend so much time putting effort into worry and that we get stuck, that we have to decide what is, you know, 
what field am I going into? What computer language am I going into? You know, all of those things. I, I would say that, uh, that play is the biggest antidote to that is that you, the future is wonderfully unknowable. It's a great mystery. And yet we spend so much time kind of freezing ourselves in place because of worry about what's going to happen. And I'm not saying that it always works out well. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying that the way it's going to work out is going to work out. And so really freeing yourself, becoming more brave and becoming more forgiving of yourself and other people through play often, you know, because it's going to work out or if it doesn't work out, you don't have much control of it. So I think that would be what I would say is don't worry so much. I Thank mean, you, you know, I, yeah. And I know that sounds like kind of curmudgeonly, but it really, it really is the message that I always have to come back to. Play, don't worry. Thank you very much. Play, don't worry. Don't worry so much. And yes. On, uh, you know, on that, I wanted to make sure that I, I posted in the in the chat this uh, Veriman thing. I wanted yes. to get people's opinion on that. Can I? That was actually in Facebook. I also posted it on YouTube. Okay. Well, um, the 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 whole thing about you know these serious topics you know i uh i mentioned a couple of minutes ago that when i was on this ai task force i was really fascinated at how many you know pretty you know bright educated passionate people in the state of vermont were so were were frozen by worry about ai and they, they couldn't see the possibility so one of the things that i've used I, i've tried to create technology that's fun and transparent enough that it you know that people lean into it that they get curious about it that they they don't they no longer fear it it's not that they should necessarily trust ai but i wanted to demystify it so this program was something my friend va and i wrote uh, partially to it, mostly to get people to sort of open up around ai and realizing that it can be mm -hmm. fun and that you can look at the code and that there's no evil kind of thing in there <laughs> it doesn't it's not to say that things like that play like that will actually completely changed the equation, but making it something open, getting somebody curious about it allows you to sort of reframe so that it's not some horrible black box that either is, you know, the end of us or is going to solve all of our problems. So go play with that. Um, did, did you actually get to show people how it worked? I did not get to show people how it works, but and I have I? posted the link. Yeah, definitely. If you could just share your screen, then people can see it. Yeah. How do I? Let's see here. Let's see. Same button. So if you go look at uh, this Veriman, so um, this is, uh, you go in there and you can run it on a, uh, I run, I'm running under Chrome here, but it'll run on an iOS or an Android box. And basically it's a, it uses uh, TensorFlow, uses PoseNet, which is based on TensorFlow. And then it, it's written in TensorJS. And my friend Vaz uh, helped me really uh, redo my crafty prototype. But it base and the, and the Git is down at the bottom in case you want to look at the source code. But it basically converts. Can you hear that, Tanya? Yep. So if you can put this on your phone, it makes somewhat beautiful music. But it's just using it's just trained on tens of thousands of people's positions, and as you can tell, it's getting my my skeleton sort of so that's a piece of ai that you can do and and we've actually got a bunch of tutorials that you can actually look at so if you're you know an advanced high school student uh you could you could actually do it yourself it, anyway the whole idea is this was something i did because i was supposed to be working on something else so back to play <laughs> that is incredible perfect example and, of and play it, in this. actually i don't yeah. think i have time to, to to actually show how it does but it, it, it's also a midi controller so you know, if I need to, uh, um, you know, I want to uh, run run my Tesla coil with it. I'm just, I'm not going to run my, can I just fire up yeah, Tesla? Yeah, sure, why not? Run? Why not? Take a look at this. <laughs> I'm going to move that so that it's not front of that window. How often do you get to see somebody controlling uh, a Tesla coil and generating music with it with their hands? <laughs> that is uh, pretty Pretty incredible. often. <laughs> yeah. 
Now I can hook that up to the Veramin, but I think let's it's just in the interest of safety because this is right next to my brain. I'm not gonna do that right now, but trust <laughs> me, there's a good use of IoT. <laughs> that, is a, that is a pretty amazing use of IoT. Thank you very much for sharing that, John. And so once again, thank you very much, John. It was an honor having you on the show. I absolutely love so the different points fun, that you mentioned. Thank you very much. It was great to have you on. I, I love what you mentioned around play and how play is really a mindset, right? It's, 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 it's about being able to explore, being curious, misbehaving, and, and, and not really following those rules, right? It's not just about you know, Nerf guns in the office. It's, it's about the way you think about the work that you do. That is incredible to hear. Uh, again, thank you very much. It was an honor to have you on the show. Super fun. Thank you very much. And once and again, thank you. Here, if anybody wants information, wants to hang out, talk about the Vermin, send me a note. Sounds great. Yeah, feel free to put any questions or anything else that we didn't get to today in the comments of the YouTube video, uh, and we will definitely get back to them uh, and, and, and help you out. And with that, thank you very much once again for, for joining in today, everybody. I really do hope you enjoyed. Uh, and thank you very much, John, for joining today. It was, uh, it was really fun having you on the show. It was total, total pleasure. It was, uh, it was love coming. So <laughs> take it easy, everybody. Say hi to your folks. Really I will do that. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.